Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We're descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please, have a seat. Grace to you and peace in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. You ever watch an artist, a potter, throw a pot on a spinning wheel? Well, if you have, you're going to like this. If you haven't, you're going to. I know you can't see this. It's never that fast. (laughs) And mine used to do this all the time because I'm not that steady. I share this with you and watched him collapse this pot at the end. You couldn't see this. He built the pot and then he beckoned the ball. To say that the same clay can take a whole lot of different forms. The same clay can take a whole lot of different forms. Since the earliest times of humanity, human beings have been trying to describe God. And trying to describe that is what we call religion. It's how we talk about this relationship we have with the divine being, whatever name you want to give the divine being. That's religion. It describes a relationship between we, the created, and the one who made us. Try to describe God who created us and cares for us and provides for us and the relationship where we receive stuff and we give thanks for that. Because that's really the way it works. We sometimes forget that that's the way it works, but that's the way it works. Everything you've ever done is a response to something God's already given you. You Think about that for a minute. Anything, everything you've ever done is a response to something God has already given you whether that was life or breath or family or community or skills or talent or education or resources, all those come from the divine, the creator of all things. So everything we do is a response. Now, for most of history, humanity has understood this relationship with the divine to function through one person, priest, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, I'm going to name a few of these, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, Samuel, Saul, David, Solomon, just to name a few. A little later on, we got access to God through these people. This is the one God talked to, and then this person talked to us, and you didn't want to get too close to God. You remember when Moses came out of the tent, he glowed, a little radioactive. People didn't want to get too close to that, so they talked to Moses kind of like this, don't get that stuff too close to me. I don't want to be that, that close to the Lord. And for most of humanity, we've talked about the divine that way as somebody with an intercediary, somebody that's in between us and God that brings that word and takes back our thanks. That continues well into the 16th century until there was um, an inquisitive, logical, persistent, stubborn monk Martin, who one day for some reason, he was well versed in this order of things, pope, priest, bishops, all those kind of things. He was a doctor of the church, a teacher of pastors and clergy. And one day reading Romans 3, it sounded different. 
Nobody knows why. But on that day, all of a sudden, Luther came to some impasse where all the things he understood about church and this passage of Romans were incongruent. They would not hold together. That all this hierarchy, all this intercessory stuff was not required in order to access God. That God had said to each individual human being, I am your God and you can come directly to me. Now you can imagine the upset that that caused in the Roman Catholic Church who had a whole business and an empire out of being the intercessories who ran everything and and so they enforced this kind of behavior in lots of ways by um, alms, kind of tweaking your money out of you for indulgences to relieve your ancestors from pain and hell and purgatory, from being excommunicated or the fear thereof because the understanding of the day was if you were separated from the church, if you were separated from the priest, you were therefore condemned and going the wrong direction. And so it was a real leverage, if you will, for the church to keep everybody in line and giving them their money. (laughs) Churches have been doing that a long time. Luther, when he read Romans 3, heard something different. That's not necessary for salvation. God comes directly to us. God loves us so much that he gave us this thing freely. This immeasurable gift of salvation is a gift for which you cannot compensate. It's like when your parent or your grandparent gave you a gift beyond description and there's nothing you can do except just say thank you because you can never pay it back. This is bigger than that. Can never pay it back. Give thanks for, behave in different ways that pay honor to, but you never get even. Ever. Our salvation is not obtained through human observances, practices, or hierarchy, or our salvation is, put quite simply, an immeasurable, gracious gift from God, just because God wants to give it to you. Not because you did anything right, and not because you didn't do anything wrong. He just loves you so much, he wants to give it to you. Not one, not one human being is able to earn this gift. Not one. There's no distinction. All are guilty of falling short. All don't deserve it, and yet all are offered it. It doesn't make any logical sense. But oh my goodness, what a gift. The point of all of this is to say, that the clay, I'm going back to the pot, sorry you couldn't see that, back to the clay, is that the clay can take a whole bunch of different shapes and forms, but the clay, if you will, is the relationship that I as an individual and you as an individual have with God Almighty. That's the clay. That's the point. And it can take a lot of different forms. If you've been at this for more than a year or two, being Christian, you know that your faith isn't the way it was years ago. It moved. It changed. It's been up. It's been down. It's been absent. It's been profound. It's been all over the place. And it's had a lot of different forms and practices. I don't practice my faith the way I did when I was 20. I suspect you don't either. But the relationship remains. It doesn't go away. It stays put and takes different forms. And that's a good thing because our lives take different forms. Our circumstances take different forms. Our objectives, our challenges, our obstacles take different forms. And our faith needs to fit that. Sticking to the same old way just doesn't necessarily work the best. Now, there's a lot of forms on planet Earth right now. I like to joke that they're all on the same side of the street, these Christian forms, to name a few. Roman Catholic, Orthodox, Lutheran, Episcopal, Methodist, United Church of Christ, Presbyterian, Mennonite, Moravian, Baptist, non-denominational. This is only part of them. 
They're all forms. They're all ways of practicing this relationship with God, and they talk differently. And we need them all because not everybody can be a Lutheran. This doesn't work for everybody. Some people need to be Roman Catholics, and some people need to be Baptists, and some people need to be non-denominationals, like our big sister congregation around the corner. The point is, how do we understand the relationship with God? Personally, individually, face-to-face. As Lutherans, we've re-thrown this clay a lot of times. In my short years, we've gone from the United Lutheran Church to the Lutheran Church in America to the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and we're doing what we've always done. We throw them together for a while, and they'll hold together for a while, and then they start to splinter off. And we're starting to see some groups splinter off. Now we have the North American Lutheran Church, which doesn't think the same way that we think sometimes. And so it's had a lot of different forms. Closer to home, this congregation's had a lot of different forms. A lot of different people have stood where I stand. The building's been a little different. 1981, you turned it around. Altar used to be over there. Did it change the relationship with God? No. Just a different way of doing it. And so what you're in the process right now in this time of transition is you're talking about what you want the next form to look like. What's the next thing Christ Lutheran Church needs to be for what's coming next? Not what it was. You did that already. You're still here and you're vital. You did that already. Thanks for all that people. Thanks for all that work. That allows us to stand in this place and wonder what's next. And you have some decisions to make over the next six months. What's it going to look like? What are you looking for in the next person that stands where I'm standing? What skills and talents do they need? What do they need to complement what you've got to take you where you think God's leading you as a community? Change the form. Is that scary? Sometimes. Is it exciting? Always. Is it necessary? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you want to stay the way you are and the way you've been, that's, that's okay. You can do that. But you're not going to be adaptable to what's next. And the world's going to keep going. And you're not. And I don't think that's what you want. It feels more comfortable. It's a lot less work. But it's not nearly as exciting. We're in the process of throwing your clay, not changing your relationship, just talking about how it's expressed and what forms it takes and what that looks like. That's fun. Because if we get it wrong, we break it down and do it again. This isn't a one and done. The decisions we're making aren't eternal. God did that. The decisions we're making are for what's next. What's it going to look like? What do you want it to look like? What's helpful to you? A lot of the conversations I have is, well, you know, why aren't we drawing young people? Because this doesn't get it for them. The ones that sit and suffer this with us go, because I have to be here. This really doesn't do it for me. Sorry, I'm putting you on the spot. This really doesn't do it for me. What I would really like would be. And the question is, Adults, are you willing to let them have it? Are you willing to let it be what they need it to be because they're going to be here after you're not? You don't have to give it all up, but you're going to have to share and make some space. You remember, those of you that are married, what it was like when you tried to put your two collections of furniture together in one house? Apparently you do. (laughs) And you had to decide whose chair you kept and whose went away. That's what we're doing. That's what this process is about. That's why I'm here with you, is to decide which furniture you keep and which goes away to make room for something new. It's going to be a both and. It's okay. It makes you a little crazy. It's okay. 
Say so. You're not the only one. Most of you in here are a little bit anxious, especially when I talk like this. <laughs> He's going, oh my, what's he going to do now? Well, don't know. I don't know. God hasn't let me know that yet. You haven't let me know that yet. But I'm going to help you do what you need to do as best I can. Because my job is to get you as ready as possible for who's coming. And I don't get to stay long enough to see the fruit. I may not even get long enough to see the plant pop up. But I am long enough to help you get the soil right. Can we place ourselves in the right place, in the right atmosphere, with the right moisture and the right fertilization and the right watering so that you can grow in ways that God has in mind for you? That's what this is about. That's what Luther made possible because he was stubborn enough to stand up to, now get this, the, the only existing church of his day, which was equal to the power of a Roman empire, and for this monk, who was one of them, to stand up and say, this isn't working for me. I want to talk about this. And the system was so anxious to preserve itself that it shut him up and kicked him out rather than have a conversation. You're Lutherans. Don't do that. Have the conversation. And let's see what God has in mind. May the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus this day and forevermore. Amen. The hymn is number 729.